Our next speaker is Matt Peterson. Matt is the senior editor and associate publisher with Reef to Rainforest Media, as well as Coral Magazine. He's been an aquarist for over 35 years. He's one of the most dedicated guys in the hobby that I know of. Uh, he's actively involved in the Marine Breeding Initiative. He's spawned over 30 species of fish in captivity, uh, and he does an excellent job with limited resources. Um, today, he's gonna be talking about the next step, meeting the aquaculture needs of your local fish store. So please give Matt Peterson a round of applause. Thank you, Tim. Can you guys hear me all right? Are we on, are we not on? All right, good. Um, so, yeah, uh, first I wanna say that being here on a Saturday in Orlando is pretty fantastic, even though we got a hurricane barreling down on us. Um, you know, I wanna thank all of you guys for coming, especially since it's a shortened schedule now, um, because you could be down there on the floor, you can always watch this on BRS TV later, so I'm really happy that we're gonna have this out there. If this talk is not catching your attention, you're not gonna offend me today if you're like, yeah, I gotta go do other things. Um, so, here's the title. I'm gonna give you a really brief intro, uh, who I am, why I'm here, Tim kinda started that. So, uh, the people who know me, you know, they know I like reef tanks, they like corals, but if I'm really honest, uh, I'm known as a marine fish breeder. So, if you've only been in the hobby a little while, you know me for the things I've done more recently, like lightning marine clownfish. Uh, if you've been around for a fair amount of time, you might remember when I was breeding harlequin filefish. And if you've been in the hobby on the freshwater side for 20 plus years, you might remember the cichlid factory um, and the cichlid recipe, which were things I did in my late teens and early 20s with John Baker. Um, so I'm up to 37 years now and keeping marine aquariums for 32 of those. And back in my early 20s uh, and my teens, I was in the aquarium trade hardcore all the time. I did maintenance, retail, wholesale, hatchery, did a little importing, and we're gonna get back to that a little later. So I'm originally from Chicago, but I fell in love with Minnesota. And uh, I met a girl there in Chicago, and she's also from Minnesota, and she is totally awesome. So I married that girl from Minnesota, we moved to Duluth. You have hurricanes, we have this, last week. <laughs> so somewhere in there I was recognized as the 2009 Mazda Award recipient, and I don't have a picture of mine handy, so there's Kevin Cohns, you'll have to trust me. Um, and uh, I said earlier, I'm, I'm known primarily as a, a marine fish breeder. Uh, you know, that's good. Uh, my wife is into the breeding too, and you know, uh, it worked out. <laughs> so we started another breeding project. That first one was so successful, equally good breeding project. And then I ended the breeding projects. <laughs> so professionally, I'm known uh, primarily as an interactive software developer. I used to be a Flash developer before Steve Jobs kind of killed that off. Uh, it doesn't matter because I ended up getting a better job uh, being a senior editor for Amazonas and Coral Magazine, uh, running the uh, website reef2rainforest.com, which is the public, uh, current home for both publications. Um, this is my fish room. This is just half of it. Um, I co-authored the Bangai uh, Cardinal Fish book with Rhett Talbot. Uh, and then as of last summer, we took over the publication of Amazonas. So myself, Shafan Tanner, and Mike Tucinardi are now the people who bring you Amazonas every, uh, every two months. So... I don't discriminate on salinity, I like all fish. That's just the nature of the beast. I'm also kind of the guy who thinks about crazy projects. You know, the kind of thing where you buy a tank that doesn't fit in your house. Uh, it's the kind of crazy project where you take apart the basement stairs uh, and then carry a 300 gallon pond through your home, drop it into the basement from the kitchen and realize this is not working out so you get another breeder to come over and it still doesn't fit. <laughs> what are we gonna do? So you get creative, you get persistent, you try three different ways of doing it, and eventually you find the one thing that's holding everything up and you succeed. So that's a little bit about me. That, yes, it's in my house, that's in my basement. So did I mention my wife is awesome because she puts up with this and uh, my kids are pretty awesome too. And that's the first time they ever had pop rocks. So, <laughs> so pretty much today, uh, the talk I'm going to give is titled The Next Steps, Meeting the Aquaculture Needs of Your Local Fish Store. Or as I like to call it, More to Life Than Clownfish, my favorite hashtag of all times. Um, so they said, when they asked me to give this talk a year ago, they said, well, we want to give you a talk on selling to retailers. I said, what? So you're, you're having the aquaculture, celebrating aquaculture conference, and you want me, the marine fish breeder, to come talk about selling I said, why don't I talk about breeding file fish? No, I did that in 2010. Uh, I could talk about building your, your marine fish room and how you accomplish that so that you can have a successful fish room. And they said, oh, 2011. 
So 2012, I said, well, I'll talk about orchids and freshwater fish and they'll never invite me back to MACNA. And so I gave my Aquarium Arc talk and then I didn't come talking to MACNA for six years. <laughs> but last year I, I came back uh, and presented my work on rethinking corallivores, uh, dealing specifically with cor cor coral feeding butterflies. And the thought process there is if I'm gonna breed a butterfly fish, I'm gonna make it one that's really gonna benefit from being captive bred. I could try to breed any and they're incredibly tough. Uh, one or two of my friends in the world have done it. But that's where I set my sights. I'm still working on that project. But back, selling to retailers. Why, are we, why am I talking about this? Well, I do have that aquarium industry history and I'm not gonna go through them today other than to put them up there and say, yeah, I did this. Um, and this is what I did. You can go look at the slide later. You can email me about these and say, well, tell me more about working at Aquascape, which was a lot of fun. Um, I also realized as I was kind of doing a self-assessment, I have a little bit of an entrepreneurial streak, if you will. Uh, it's what I like to call the side hustle. It's a symptom, I think, of being a lifelong learner. So whether I was a flash developer or publishing magazines, there was always something else going on. Um, so back in the early days, I, uh, with a partner, invited, invented something called Flash Statistics, which was basically a predecessor to Google Analytics, uh, specifically for Flash software, and I remember the day before we were supposed to meet for our final meeting with the venture capital firm, and we were all set to get our funding and go, and they said, uh, we lost our shirts on another project, so we're not gonna fund yours. That happens. Um, I was a fishing guide uh, in my early 20s, uh, and it's one of those things where I realized, hey, I would have loved to do this as my living, but it's a seasonal type of business. And so unless you're going to be committed to living in Alaska half the year and the South American coast the other half of the year, it's not, it's not a lifestyle. Um, I learned, taught myself to build fishing rods, thought I was gonna make a lot of money until I realized all the excise taxes that go into building sporting good equipment. And then on top of it, the simple act of actually doing it became physically painful. So I don't do it anymore. Uh, I got my certifications, I was all set, and then it didn't pan out. Um, I ran an orchid business, this was very successful, slipperorchid.com, it's still there. I stopped selling in 2006, but I was running it out of my home. I had orchids everywhere. I was breeding orchids, sending them off to labs to be flashed, bringing them back and my entire house was a jungle. But when you're doing that in your living space and you bring in a pesticide resistant uh, mealybug, if you will, and it ravages your entire collection, you have two things you can do. You can nuke the space, but you live there, so you can't, so you watch everything die. You stop selling and you say, I'm gonna try to battle this with the things I can do in my space, and I saved maybe enough orchids the size of this table. I had $18,000 in orchids just die. That's life, where we're dealing with living things and that was the bad position I was in and that's why I don't sell orchids anymore. I still love them. So some people know that I run Mini Waters. Um, it's kind of the overall umbrella for wholesale hatchery, retail aquarium livestock. Um, and then more recently we added vivarium livestock. And the most important thing I wanna say about Mini Waters, my side thing if you will, it doesn't need to turn a profit. So I'm in this unique position where I can tinker. I can say, let's try vivarium plants. I have an idea for why I wanna do this. And if it doesn't work out, that's okay. I just don't want it to lose money. So I'm in this unique position of, this is not my full-time income. I can tinker. But you know, I, I have this entrepreneurial spirit to the point where I'm trying to get my kids to do it. Wanna show them how a business works, just get them thinking. So you know, selling hosta seeds. When you're spending your spare time just harvesting hosta seeds and you realize, I just sold $700 worth of hosta seeds, my kids can do this, you say, hey kids, you wanna try to make some money? You wanna, you wanna do something? You know, understand what having a good work ethic is about, having a goal, and the first year it didn't pan out. That's okay. No one lost any money in this, eh, maybe 100 bucks of materials. We'll try again this year. So part of my biggest message here is, especially if you're just getting into it, unless you're whole hog, I'm okay with failure. You learn from failure quite a bit. It's okay to not meet your goals and to refine your goals. So, <clears throat> this is the one that has to make money, Amazonas. I don't have a choice being one of the partners now. We need this to work well. And so this is where most of my attention goes. Amazonas and coral, those are my lifebloods. Uh, but being in this position, I've learned a lot more about you know, working with people and just schedules and all that kind of stuff. Um, I don't consider myself a business expert. That's the bottom line. Uh, there are many people here, and I'm gonna bring it up again, but there are many people at this conference. You should bend their ear. The people who are successful, those are the ones who you wanna talk to, and maybe they'll talk to you, maybe they won't, and that's okay. So that's my background, and I'm gonna jump in. Um, first thing I wanna talk about is knowing the market, taking the pulse of where we're at today. So 
Coral Magazine and, and Macna, uh, Masna put together an aquaculture futures survey. We sent it out over to 31,000 people. Now, 31,000 people didn't answer. That's how it goes. Um, but we were basically trying to do two things. We wanted to figure out what are the current attitudes towards aquaculture, what do people think the future holds, and then secondary, the second part, if you stuck with it, was what do retailers and consumers really want? And I think that's going to be a big part if we're talking about selling, if we're talking about having a business, knowing what's going on. So you can get a really fantastic article in this program guide, this article. This is all the free form answers from dozens of people saying this is what we think our holds, uh, the future holds for our business, for our efforts. Uh, I encourage you all to read that. So what I'm going to show you are some of the more uh, quantifiable responses. So 83.6% of the respondents said they prefer to purchase aquaculture livestock. That is mind-blowing to me. And we talked on Facebook like three days ago, well, it all depends on price. Well, I'll, I'll get back to price towards the end. We asked simply, what's your preference? And the preference is, if I have the choice, I, I would prefer to do that. Um, and there's the data. There's the response right there. I'm going to put a lot of graphs and charts on the screen. You just need to know they're there so you can go back and look on BRS TV later and, and check it out and see what those are and see the error rates and see what you think and what, how you want to interpret these. So 98.1% of respondents believe aquaculture livestock is going to comprise part or all of their future purchases. And the bottom line is basically there was almost no one who said, I'm only going to be buying wild stuff in the future. Aquaculture's here, we're gonna be leveraging it. Some people said it's just gonna be aquaculture, and then the majority there said both. That's where our future's gonna be. So health and sustainability of livestock are given the most weight, and you'll see the sentiment repeated kind of over and over. Um, so we said when buying livestock, what is important to you? And here it is, if you're on the right, the higher up you are towards this three, the more important it is. That's all you need to know. And that trusted supplier, healthy animals, that's right there at number one. Net cost sustainable was their number two. Um, the aggregate sentiment uh, suggests that people believe we should reduce wild harvest of fish, corals, and inverts. And so this is what that looks like. If you're on that middle line there, the three, that nice big red, that's middle of the road. Keep it the same. So the aggregate sentiment was less for all of those. And we look at the aggregate sentiment for people uh, believing we should do more aquaculture. And that's what it looks like. So that's just the pulse. That's where we're at. That's what people are thinking and saying and how they're viewing aquaculture. But we dug deeper. So we asked wholesalers and retailers what they thought their customers wanted. And then we asked their customers what they actually wanted. I think we can see where this is going. Uh, how in tune were they? So again, you don't need to look at that whole thing there. It's just there. That's wholesaler responses. Here is retailer responses, and here are the retail consumer responses. <clears throat> this is how they compare. Health, number one, across the board. Guarantees, special orders, and being wild caught, dead last. These are things that don't matter to anyone. It's the stuff that's interesting where things shift. You know, wholesalers and retailers said, yeah, being able to offer good customer service and having a diversity on our list, that's really important. The consumer said, eh, it's not so important because being quarantined and being aquacultured is, is more important. Now, I can't justify that or, or say, well, how do you accomplish that? This is just what we heard. Um, pricing. We always hear that pricing is the most important thing or right up there. You know, wholesalers put it at number three. Retailers put it at number two. Consumers put it at number five, which is kind of in the middle. But when you look at statistically, um, the, it's kind of mixed in there with diversity and customer service, and so this is kind of how it looks. For This is the consumer side of things. Here's their most importance. Here's their kind of middle of the road, and you can kind of see where pricing is tied with uh, being quarantined and aquacultured and a diversity of choice. It's right. It's the, any one of those could be more important than the other. And then there down towards the end, that wild-caught livestock, dead last. Consumers don't care if it came from the wild, but they do care. Uh, they do have this slight preference for aquaculture. So how do I interpret this? I'm just going to kind of recap what I just said. Their foremost concerns are health and quality. The secondary concerns that I see are being aquaculture and quarantine, having a diversity of choice, and yes, price and customer service matter, but maybe not as much as retailers and wholesalers thought. Um, what doesn't matter so much are those guarantees, the warranties, being able to special order, or something being wild caught as opposed to aquaculture. And I really want to talk about guarantees and warranties and just say, if you're providing the highest health and quality, your customers aren't going to have to be so worried about guarantees and warranties. And on the flip side, it's really easy to offer them because you're not going to have many problems. So you want to start an aquaculture business. 
selling to retailers, that is an aquaculture business in my book. Here's what not to do. I call this the lemon yellow story. So a guy walks into a fish store. Uh, you want to buy my fish? Store guy goes, eh, not, not really. But look at them, they're fantastic, they're, they're amazing. And the shop guy goes, well, look at my tanks. Does it look like I need more? Mm, okay, I guess not. Uh, well, uh, what do you give me for them? Because I'm here with them and, and I, I don't want to take them back. Shop guy sees an opportunity and says, dollar each store credit. The guy goes, oh, okay, I guess. I guess that's what I'm going to do. That's what happens when you're not thinking like a business. And that's really what I'm going to talk about. I had this happen many times working retail where someone is breeding something and they think they're going to make a lot of money and they walk into the store just with a bucket full of fish and say, hey, I got these. What do you give me for them? That's not the way you, make, you get ahead in this world. So number one thing out of everything else, the overriding thought process, it's a business, be professional. And what does that mean? What does it mean to be professional? For, to me, it means be competent. Know what you're talking about. It means to be presentable. It means not showing up with a bucket full of fish. Uh, it means to be respectful, and you're going to kind of hear that weaved into everything. The shop owner, while he might give you a dollar a piece store credit because you came in unprepared, he's also, well, that's really all he has to give or wants to give, and it's his choice. And have integrity. This one comes up over and over in the freeform responses. Deal honestly, deal with integrity, your life will be so much easier. The shop owner isn't out to screw you, the wholesaler isn't out to screw you, they're just being honest with you, and you can take it or leave it. So, who do stores buy from? This was a fantastic one because everyone gets equal footing in my, in my view when I look at this. Everyone has a shot. Transshippers, wholesalers, everyone has a shot. Down there at the bottom is small scale aquaculture, hobbyists. You guys are basically on equal footing here, if you want to be. Um, so what do they want from their suppliers? And I, this is just a free form. Uh, I looked at the free form responses and kind of pulled out some highlights. Uh, well, first, actually, we'll get to this one. I'm jumping ahead. So what do wholesalers think the retailers want versus what did retailers say they want from their suppliers? Once again, comparing who's, how are we uh, gonna look at this? And so here it is. Customer service, reliability, and professionalism. Top three across the board, very highly ranked. Here in the middle, you know, various rankings, but basically uh, professional relationships, order fill rates, access to rare items, you know, that, that kind of stuff. Uh, and down here at the bottom, the one that no one cared about was, hey, hey send me the fish and I'll pay you later. Uh, or, hey, I need, I need a little time. Um, I think we're in the age where credit cards are ubiquitous, businesses have access to capital, they're not worried about getting credit, um, so you don't need to extend that. And again, here's where things shifted up. Uh, where retailers said, well, hey, we need access to rare items, we want traceability, and look at where the wholesalers thought it was. And then this one, personal relationships, and this is an interesting one, because to me, having worked wholesale, personal relationships are incredibly important. They're incredibly important to closing a sale, but they don't matter at all to the retailer. So this is, this is wholesalers, to, in my mind, recognizing the value that a personal long-term relationship has with a customer relationship, but it has very little to do with what retailers care about. That's the dichotomy I see. If you give me a new supplier, well, I don't care who the salesperson is. The wholesaler knows the, who the salesperson is probably does matter. Um, so what did Source say was their largest problems? Where are the opportunities? Uh, availability of animals, large colonies of corals, and we know why, because we don't have large colonies of coral coming in from Indonesia. Healthy fish, we saw it repeatedly said. Net caught fish came up, maricultured coral, we're not getting a lot of maricultured coral because our biggest sources for those are not able to ship. Uh, more aquacultured fish came up repeatedly. Aquacultured fish other than clownfish, there's my hashtag in real life from a store owner. Um, quality stock, that's the same thing as health. Quality shipping, don't send me fish that die. Um, I heard this a couple times. Wholesale coral prices at this point are too high. They're getting near retail and I kind of have to look at a retailer and say, you might have to raise your prices. Wholesalers are gonna ask what they need. You might have to ask what you need and if you can't make it work, um, that's business. Access to specialty fish came up repeatedly. Large corals, again, repeatedly. I have it on here twice. And wild corals at a decent price. Well, aquaculture company isn't going to be providing that anyways. So I asked retailers, what is your advice for a new supplier? So. They said, give me accurate stock lists, don't short our orders. Uh, be honest and fair, that's that integrity aspect. Keep pricing reasonable. Retailers need to make a profit too, and that's gonna come back again because I hear it a lot from people who ask me about it. Um, don't send anything that is not healthy 100%. Provide quality. Look out for the best interests of your customers. 
who is your customer as a wholesaler or an aquaculture? It's the retailer. So do retailers like buying from their customers? And this was kind of an open-ended question. Here's what they said, yeah, we do. Uh, we welcome it, or I welcome it as much as I can. Locally grown stuff is the best stuff. There's no shipping costs, there's no uh, losses, there's no shipping losses, there's no hard acclimation. I prefer to see it in person. Pictures don't always do it justice. So these are all pluses. If you're making the case for an aquaculture business and a local one, here you go. Uh, most are happy with store credit, but I'll give an outright uh, wholesale price if someone asks for it. So, and not everyone was the same because some of them said, well, we give store credit only in rare cases. Um, they need to be a trusted source before we're gonna work with them. Uh, I'm cautious with who I buy from. And people walking in off the street, first time getting into this, they have a hard time grasping the nature of wholesale versus retail when it comes to pricing. Again, there's this big overarching concern I have in multiple conversations with people. Well, stores won't pay me what I need. And I'm saying, well, the stores are telling you the price they can pay. We're gonna have to work on that. And realize neither of us are gonna get rich. That came from a store owner. So be a partner. That's really what it's about to me. When I started selling uh, and really said, I'm gonna do a lot of hatchery work in my basement outside of marine fish, I, I walked into my local store and I said, what do you need that you can't get anywhere else? And she said, angelfish and guppies. So what did I start producing? Angelfish and guppies. I gave the store what they want. Um, I leveraged my retail experience walking into that store to find them, help them find ways to sell those fish at a higher margin. Uh, I didn't say, well, here's the price, you figure it out. I act as a consultant, I acted as a partner and gave them my viewpoints. They took some of them, others they didn't. I listened to their feedback when they said, man, these fish, they're, they're not moving so much. Well, I'm gonna produce less of them. I realized that when my customers make money, I make money. So I don't have to put my money first as long as I've kind of developed a sound plan. I need to make sure that I have good, healthy customers. Um, and most importantly, I maintain a perspective on where I fit into that shop's overall equation. I'm one tiny supplier out of two or three dozen. I'm giving them one specialty subset of animals. I'm not the bread and butter. I'm the specialty guy. I'm the guy that they like dealing with. But at the end of the day, if they're in a crunch, they might not be doing business with me. They might have to deal with their big wholesalers. So I really like this talk that Corey uh, McElroy, the uh, aquarium co-op on YouTube, I want you to look it up because it gives you perspective. So he has a really great presentation on how to open a fish store, uh, or you know, as he puts it, how to trade your social life for a small business. I think we as people who wanna maybe start something part time or on the side or just leverage our, our clownfish breeding have to have perspective on what a store owner is up against, what they are dealing with. And this is probably one of the best no holds barred, bear, bear it all, this is what it took for me to open my store with $50,000. This is what I got. Here's how all the money broke down. This is a fantastic perspective. And that, I think, is what a lot of people who are getting into business need. They need some perspective. They also need to determine their personal goals. What are you gonna do? What are your aspirations? Are you just gonna make some spare change on the side? Do you want your hobby to be financially self-sustaining? Do you wanna test the waters for a career change? Are you just jumping in right now on a career change? Do you want world domination? You wanna be the number one? Um, you, know? uh, you have to assess that. You have to determine what your goals are. By the same token, you gotta figure out what you're good at. And you gotta figure out where you're weak. You gotta know, uh, I'm really bad at writing emails. Maybe find someone to help you with that. Um, what's your risk tolerance? Is it okay? Can you send out a shipment of fish and if they die, are you okay eating that? Or is that really gonna be a problem for you? Um, you really gotta know. Uh, if you're gonna put up $10,000 and you lose it all, are you okay with that? Are you gonna go into debt? What is your risk tolerance? And are you being realistic? Pie in the sky dreams of world domination are great, but do you have a realistic way of getting there? Um, but no matter what, I feel like whether you're walking in and selling a few frags or you're bringing an order every week, it's a business. You are in business. And entrepreneurial life to me, uh, some of my favorite things, 3 a.m. is normal, I'm always up all night. Uh, seven days a week, there's no rest, there's no vacation, no one gives me a paid vacation. If I decide I'm not gonna work that day, I'm not getting paid that day. That's my trade-off. Um, doing what you love is not enough. Because a lot of shop owners, oh, I'm gonna open a store, and I'm gonna have the store and it's gonna be fantastic, but don't forget to pay yourself. Too many people are willing to sacrifice too much. And that's where we come back to saying, is this realistic? So you gotta do your aquaculture biz homework. And there's a lot of homework, and this is kind of the meat and the boring part, but you're gonna incorporate, you're gonna have a resale tax ID. I think everyone should have that. Check out your state and local laws, because they're different. Uh, would you believe that in Minnesota, laws for trout farms technically affect having a hatchery. 
of clownfish. Uh, who are the regulatory agencies you need to deal with? And then ask around, I said it earlier, there are many people in this building who will give you a perspective uh, that have no conflict of interest in doing so, and so they're happy to talk to you because I think most people here come into a conference, a big part of this is sharing knowledge and helping each other succeed. Keep listening to the talk, it's on BRS. You can always go back, look through it again. So you gotta plan some key things. I'm just throwing these out there for the people who have not thought about it, writing a business plan. The SBA just took down their online um, software for doing that, but the SBA is still a great resource. Locally, look around locally, at University of Minnesota Duluth, we have this great thing, the Center for Economic Development. Uh, my wife was looking at starting a business and she went in and talked with someone for an hour. Here's the kind of business we're interested in. And here's another kind of business we're thinking about doing. What do you think? Just a sounding board, but it could go a lot further. They would do a lot of the research that would need to be done. You'd have students come on board. You can look to local organizations like this, chambers of commerce. There are places and resources available for someone who wants to get into an entrepreneur, entrepreneurial life. Um, but you gotta know your numbers. You absolutely have to know your numbers. Part of that is your business plan, but you gotta know how the livestock trade works. So these are very gross generalizations. You probably have heard it, but basically speaking, a retailer is gonna mark up what he pays two to three times at, at, at the wholesale value, and that's what he's gonna be asking. And a wholesaler, and I know this from talking to wholesalers who are friends of mine and running my own, they're marking it up anywhere between 20% to 100%, doubling that price. And the bold ones, the three and the two, those are the numbers I grew up on in the trade. Those seem to be pretty ingrained. These are the margins that the aquarium trade seems to prefer to work. But there are places, um, oh, did I take that slide out? Oh yes, so if you know the target price for whatever customer you're dealing with, you can reverse engineer to figure out where you're gonna be able to be at, roughly speaking. So if a black oscillator sells retail for 40 bucks, you can kind of figure a retailer wants to get it for around $13, and you can kind of figure that a wholesaler, they probably wanna pay about 650 for it. If you're in a really low margin markup uh, place like LA, some areas of Florida I've come to find out, Retailers might not be using that three time, they might be doubling, so they might be selling it to their customers for 25 bucks, but the retailer's still probably paying $13, and the wholesaler is still probably landing it for 650. That's kind of how the aquarium market works, and that's a gross generalization, and every business is gonna be different, but you can use these kind of figures, talk to your stores that you're intending to serve, and kind of figure out where you, where you need to be. I mean, I worked in a retail store where if I could market up 5,000%, I would. So these are just the, the base points. Some people say, well, I'm buying a conspic. Yeah, I'm not gonna put a three-time markup on a conspic. Um, but when I would go to the, fish holes, uh, to the fish auctions and get bags of fish for a dollar, I was not passing that along to my customers. I was putting them at regular prices. That's the whole point. You have to look for opportunities. It's a business. So you gotta crunch the numbers. And I love this um, because back when I wrote the Bangai Cardinal Fish book, it didn't make it into the actual book, but I literally said, okay, here's the hatchery I set up for the lab, for the research. What if I took this and made this an actual Bangai hatchery? Um, so this is not how I would set up a Bangai hatchery. This is a small mom and pop thing, but here's how it worked out. I had you know, roughly 4, 400 gallons for broodstock. I had 75 gallons for like incubating in early, early life stages and 200 for, for grow out. I'd probably change those numbers now. But these figures, Take into account no employees, being home-based, no marketing, none of this stuff, not paying yourself for your time. So again, you don't need to read all that. You can go back and look at it. That bottom number is what's important. My little hatchery, paying retail for all my materials, every screw, every piece of wood, $14,000. My known annual costs, as it worked out, I knew I was gonna be going through a certain amount of food, uh, salt mix, uh, what was that all gonna cost? Again, retail figures. Uh, I guesstimated it and kind of calculated it out to be about 5,000 bucks a year to run the thing. Um, and then there's this whole empty expanse of things I didn't put numbers on. Um, you know, do, this is the place where you can go into a spreadsheet. I'm happy to share the spreadsheet with you, by the way. Um, are you gonna cover delivery costs for your clients? Well, put it in here. Uh, you're gonna have a website and you gotta pay someone to do it? Put that cost in here. What are you gonna have for taxes, insurance, legal? All these things are all variables that you gotta play with in your business and figure it out. So I came up with some production numbers and I looked at what a bang guy could produce, what was realistic, and I kinda said in this hatchery, uh, I would guess 200 a month is when things are running well. I'll produce 200 bang guys a month. So you'll notice over here on the right, 450. That's the price maybe I would sell them to at a farm. And these numbers are kinda modern numbers, but Bangai is just the model. It's not what we're really worried about. So 200 going to a, a wholesaler every month for $4.50, that works out to yearly re gross revenue, $10,000, $11,000. If I was just gonna wholesale, 
same amount of fish, I'd have a gross revenue of $21,000, but I'm selling to retailers now, I'm selling to stores. And if I could ever figure out how to sell 200 retail bang guys at 27 apiece direct to consumers, wow, I'm gonna make $65,000 a year. Does anyone in this room think they could do that? Your only, your only product is bang guys, and you're gonna sell 200 a month, and most people buy two to six at a time. Do you think you can do that? Find all those customers? I, I don't. <clears throat> so, looking at those different supply channels where you enter the market, uh, if, you're, if you're a farm, if you are selling to wholesalers, you have very large quantities of fish going out, you have, don't have a lot of customers to deal with, you have standing orders, you have a lot less hassle. It's, it's, it's harvest time, we pick it up, we take it over here, we drop it off, we're done. Uh, if you're wholesale, you have moderate quantities, you know, shop might order a dozen uh, at a time, they really wanna add other things. You'll have more customers, you'll have more ebb and flow in your revenue, it's not gonna be as stable. Retail, small orders, far more headaches, harder sales to accomplish, it's very simple. So. I remember being told this, they'll burn you at the stake. If you sell farm and wholesale and retail, no one's gonna wanna do business with you. Well, that's the way the world works now. Um, as long as you're fair about your prices, and we're gonna talk about pricing a lot later, um, you can do it. I think people have mostly gotten over the hump, it's more of an old point of view, that well, if you're selling to wholesale, you can't sell to retail. There are still stores who will say that, and that's fine. You have to decide whether that's a problem you wanna deal with or not. So I came up with a hypothetical what if I sold to everyone? What if I had a big standing order going to a farm, 100 fish, had a couple wholesale customers, they'd take you know, 80 a month, and then maybe I would have a website and I'd put my best band guys and pair them up and sell them retail. And this is what the revenue kind of worked out to be. And you'll remember I said 200 was kind of my, I felt it was an average, but what if I had bad months? Or what if I just wasn't that good of a breeder? What if I was not able to produce more than 100 band guy a month? Well, here's the numbers, everything just changes and you know you're making less money. What if I could hit my theoretical maximum production and get 485 and sell all those fish? Here's where I'd be. So it really, this whole thing is just an exercise of crunching the numbers, asking yourself, is this realistic? So I came up with a couple projections and I'll show them to you really quick. Um, I only used the very conservative and my middle of the road numbers, selling all channels, and this is kind of what they look like on a five year plan, how they come out. Um, you know, if you're barely scraping by, you're making, you, you've made a f gross profit after five years of $5,000. That's not a lot of money. Uh, if you're hitting middle of the road, well here, first this is how it looks. There's your, where you are in terms of being in the red, coming up and crossing that line into overall being in the blue uh, and, or green if you prefer. And this is what it looks like. If you can hit maybe that 200 target I threw out there using those numbers, reminding you all that I did not pay myself. There's no, there's no employees, there's no insurance costs, there's no overhead because it's in my home. So you have to go through and turn all those numbers and figure out, is this a good plan? Am I making a smart decision? Um, but that's how it looks. So there's this interesting thing in the marine fish world that I like to call the cost of production. And so first, using those models, I figured out cost of production for Bangai, and I came up with a range. So at the low end, if I'm really not producing a lot of fish, each one of those Bangai's in those models, ending that five year period cost me $7.69 to rear. If I just doubled the number of fish I was putting out and could sell them all, well, you know, roughly halved it. I also did a couple things where I ramped up production faster. I was better at doing this. Okay, so these are all just hypothetical examples, crunching the numbers, see where you're gonna be. But that's a big difference between whether you're profitable or not. And these are realistic numbers. I wanna stop for a moment and just talk about Joe Lichtenbert who ran Reef Propagations Inc. Um, in over 20 years, I have his numbers. 900,000 clownfish out of a basement about the size of the one I showed you. And his cost per fish was about $4.25. He had a very profitable business. And only when the wholesale price of clownfish dropped to that $4 mark was he in trouble and said, I'm gonna retire. I don't, I don't wanna deal with this anymore. I've been doing it for 20 years. I can retire, I made my money. Um, so there's this interesting thing, the designer paradigm, as I'm calling it today. I'm gonna to use freshwater angelfish as the model and all the figures I'm gonna give you are just approximations. It's just, it's just a, an exercise in understanding how things work. So on the left, we have a wild type silver angel. In the middle, we have a Philippine blue angelfish. And on the right, we have a Pinoy Wi-Fi veil angelfish. So if I'm gonna start breeding angelfish, that silver pair to get that brood stock might cost me $50. That Philippine blue to set up a pair might cost me 100. To get a really nice high-end Wi-Fi Pinoy veil, $250. That's a big difference as far as broodstock acquisition costs. 
But over, the, over their lifetime, let's say they're each gonna produce 2,000 fry. What does that broodstock cost end up being going into the fish you produce? And here it's two cents on the left roughly, uh, five cents in the middle and 12 cents on the end. But, oh, I'm jumping ahead here. So the cost of production, that's where we wanna be. Um, whether you're rearing a wild type angelfish or a pinoy veil, they all cost the same amount to produce. They're all angelfish. So the cost to produce each one of these fish is pretty much on par. Whether you're doing silvers or Philippine blues or Pinoy Wi-Fi veils, they all cost, you know, this would cost 25% 25 25 higher than the one on the far end. But this is where it all changes because the wholesale value of these fish, well, that wild type silver is a buck 50, that Pinoy uh, on the right is 825, that blue in the middle is four. Those are real prices, I got those prices. That's what I sold those fish for. And my customers were really happy some of those fish were much more profitable than the others. That's just the reality of it. So the gross profit for fish, here it was. And again, totally hypothetical numbers. I'd have to go back and crunch my angel hatchery to figure out what my cost of production really was. So the interesting thing about designer fish, and this is, I'm lumping designer fish being any genetic mutation, uh, any hybrid that's not in the wild, they don't have um, the competition. They don't have wild competition. So producers are free to ask whatever price they want and whether they get it or not is totally between the market. Um, they cost generally the same to produce. So if you're gonna produce clownfish, yeah, you're probably gonna wanna produce lightning maroons. Um, the prices on designer fish like this, rare fish tend to fall as the supply increases. That's kind of a duh thing. You know, the, the $1,000 lightning maroon of yesteryear was, is now the $100 lightning maroon of today. Um, but it still costs the same to produce as that white stripe, which is only a $20 fish. So I can't really fault the people who are going into designer anything or named anything because the profit, the market's willing to pay for it and it costs the same to produce. So you talk over the years to a lot of different producers and they say, yeah, it, it is the designer things that are kind of pulling our business and giving us the money to do the more altruistic things we might want to do, the new species we want to work on. Um, but I also like to point out rare fish, you know, McCulloughy clowns. There's no wild fishery for McCulloughy's, so the price you're seeing on McCulloughy today is the price that's reflective purely of the market. But in the grand scheme of things, I don't think a McCulloughy clownfish costs a lot more to produce than a tomato clownfish. Or it could tell me, no, Matt, you're really wrong. It costs a lot more. I don't know. Uh, I've never bred McCulloughy. But I'm going to hedge a guess that probably not. And so if they can produce McCulloughy and people will buy them, they're going to make more money on those than a regular orange oscillaris per unit. So I've been talking about fish because that's the world I come from. But I really feel like there are absolutely similarities between fish and coral. Um, you know, I look at uh, the bubblegum digifrag I brought home from uh, Macna, and I paid like, I would have paid 80, 80 bucks for it. Or I could get the orange digifrag for 10. Culturally, culturally, they are exactly the same. This one's worth more, but they take the same amount of resources to produce. Well, duh, which one are you gonna produce? Um, you might produce orange digi if your store says, I really have no supply for orange digi, and I will buy all the orange digi you can produce, because you'll still make money. Uh, that's important. Um, and I'm not really gonna touch on it more than right here, just the diversity of lists. No one is gonna say, I'm only gonna produce one thing. It's, it's impossible to get into your stores. Other than for that one thing, well, you're gonna be limited to this very small thing. I'm the orange digi guy. That's not gonna fly. Um, but pretty much because corals are produced asexually currently, uh, and we're dealing with cultivars and clones, we're not producing 2,000 digis a month out of this one little thing. These aren't clownfish, so the prices on corals work differently than the prices on producing fish because of the limited production you get out of corals in relation to fish. It's very easy to overproduce fish. So, they'll burn you at the stake part two. I'm coming back to this because I like this. Um, so I had a problem. Um, I had fish people wanted. I had lightning maroons. I had a fair amount of them. And the stores weren't willing to carry them. What am I gonna do? I spent three years telling people I'm wholesale only. I'm wholesale only, have your store call me, I'm happy to sell to them. And in the end of the day, um, that's not how it works. So if you're gonna sell wholesale retail farm, just give them no excuses, give them no reasons to hate you. So this is, you know, I don't sell lightning uh, maroons at $1,000 anymore, I, I could maybe, we'll see. Um, but that's where they were at. Three years of saying, this is $700,000 fish for this ultra maroon, and proof is in the pudding, there was the retail price on the website and down there at the bottom, the wholesale price for my wholesale customers was 250. I offered that fish to store for three years at $2, uh, not $2, $250. 
I sold all of them at retail at 1,000. I had one store buy two Lightning Maroons from me, and they made a killing. But the point is, if you can't find a price as a store that you're happy with, somewhere between 250 and 1,000, and your customer is going to come to me and give me 1,000, I'm at the point in, the, in, in my life where I'm going to take the 1,000. I gave you the fair shot. So that's kind of my viewpoint on how the modern market is working. Uh, whether you're you know, Alyssa selling seahorses, Alyssa sells wholesale, retail, and sells to wholesalers. She's, she's playing the market on all fronts, and her pricing is different and respective of the opportunity costs and the hassles that go into that. So you just be transparent and be upfront if that's what you're going to do. So we hear a lot about price in this race to the bottom in the aquarium hobby and industry. Uh, but ultimately, what's a fair price? Whatever the buyer and the seller negotiate, that's the bottom line. I can tell someone uh, that I want to deal with, you have 100 epistogramma, I would love to buy them, take them off your hands, I can give you $2 a piece because I'm going to sell them to the stores for four. And that breeder is free to say, take a hike, or mm, that sounds reasonable, or eh, can you give me three? Um, because I sell them to my customers for 12, and so we just talk and figure it out. That's what it is to me. It's not someone trying to screw you over. It's not someone trying to take advantage of you. Some people might. But mostly, it's just about having an honest dialogue and trying to figure out where things are and what's realistic and what we can achieve. And if you have to change it, you change it. That's the nature of business. It's always changing. So are we at a tipping point? So our survey, as I take it, retail consumers said price was not a top priority for them. I think we had altruistic respondents. I think this is what people want to believe. Um, History suggests to me that all else being people, people aren't willing to pay a premium for something being aquacultured or wild caught. That is history. But I think we might be at a tipping point. Maybe, I don't know. Um, and so in the current issue of Coral, uh, there's an editorial uh, that I authored with uh, James and you can read, read a much longer one at that URL online. But the bottom line is we're at a point now where you know, aquacultured yellow tangs are commercially available, they're viable and they sell for more than the wild-caught counterparts and people are buying them. So maybe there is some truth in that survey response, that maybe price is not quite as important. Maybe we're finally at that point where maybe you can ask what you feel is a fair price, you can kind of maybe not pay so much attention to the wild fish, maybe not, I don't know the answer to that. Um, so more to life than clownfish. Everyone, there was this huge, huge designer clownfish just craze over the past five years kind of this ebb and flow. I look at clownfish and no disrespect to Soren, um, but a, a black ice long fin clownfish, that's a guppy. That is the, literally the marine aquarium's guppy. That is what we're producing now. Everyone can produce guppies. Um, how many clownfish can the average hobbyist put in a tank? Two, I, yeah, two. I mean, sometimes big tank, a few more, but long term, two. So once the consumer buys your two clownfish, they're done. There is very limited upside. How many corals can they put in their tank? Dozens, thousands, hundreds, you know. So, more life than clownfish. This is where we are at in the world of marine ornamental aquaculture for fish. We just published the 2019 results. They're in Coral Magazine, they're online. We are at a point where we have bred at least once successfully in captivity 398 species of marine fish. In the last 18 months, we added collectively 39 more species. I was scrounging so hard to break 400 this year. Who, what did I overlook? What was I missing? I wanted to hit it. And I know now that number is 399 and it might be 400 by the time I leave here today. Um, so that's an incredible number. Um, so that is available online um, to fully read, to fully digest. Uh, the bottom line, we are not where we were 10 years ago. Things are changing, things are different. The way you do business is different, but a lot of the principles haven't changed. Um, and at this point, are there any questions? <laughs>